Well, hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Cocktails and Rocktails with me, your most notorious groupie, Allison Rouse, author of We've Got Tonight, The Life and Times of Newton. Well, you guys know these other little books right here have some really cool merchandise, a lot of other cool stuff. You guys go down in that description, hit my link tree up, and go take a look-see. And as I always like to begin my episodes, thank you so much for all the love, all the support, all the friendships, all the amazing women that I'm meeting here because you know what a lot of you amazing women have come on my show to tell your stories and today is no different so I mean just for that reason alone I'm so blessed but with all the amazing people all the lovely friends all the lovely stories everybody bonding here and just kind of talking to each other and creating this community with our family Thank you so much. I'm truly, truly amazed and amazed, you guys, because this today's episode, as you can see, is another podcast episode, but I have been dying to get this woman on my show for ages, and I finally have her. You guys, she's got some really amazing stories. She has really great friends, and she had a night with Elvis, so we are going to hear from a woman who I'm excited I've never talked to an Elvis groupie before so really excited to have her Miss Melody you guys are gonna love her she's such a sweetheart stay tuned because she did send in pictures as always I do like to have you know the other ladies seen and let them choose how to be seen so stay tuned for the pictures and the first picture we're gonna look at right here of course is gonna be what we're gonna drink today this is from our local uh, Sugar House, Salt Lake City Dist Sugar House Distillery. This is, now it says a raspberry whiskey sour, which I'm kind of interested in this, but you know, I can, you see I already poured it, which I'm kind of confused because it looks more like a seltzer water. So I I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to have, I've, I've drank it and it was, it was, I, I didn't get the whiskey kick I was expecting out of it. I thought it would be an actual drink, but this is more of a seltzer water while it's still good. Don't get me wrong, you got that fresh raspberry, you kind of get that slight whiskey hint. But it's still the seltzer water, which is kind of flavorless. So, all right, everybody, grab your sours, kick up your feet, and let's have a little cocktail and rocktail with the lovely Miss Melody. Say hello, everybody. All right, ladies and gentlemen, like I said, we have a really awesome lady here. She's out of California, has some killer stories from a great era. This is Miss Melody. Melody, say hello to everybody. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Oh, they're great. Hi, they're going to Hi, Miss Melody. So finally nice to speak with you. You too. I've been waiting Ever since I read your book, I've wanted to, to know you. And the, I, ever since you contacted me, I've been dying. You were like one of the people I've been dying to get on this show because I just think you're so interesting and such a great heart. So thank oh, you so thank much you. for finally coming on. I've been so excited. Thank you. You're welcome. You. All right. So we're going to kind of start. Tell us a little bit about your, what groupie era you were in and where you lived it. Okay. Um. I am the 60s girl. Uh, I think I, I met my first love, who was a famous singer, in 66. I was 14, he was 23, but he thought I was 18. And from there, it from 66 to, I would say, 71, it just escalated. So why, okay, because having been one young groupie to another, who was, how did he think you were 18? Was it because you told him? <laughs> no, he never asked my age. I oh. Had, I was the, the whimsical hippie girl, you know. Yeah. And with an attitude. And um, and he, lived, he moved in across the street from me, actually. And I was... I, in those days, you walked around with your transistor with videos. Yeah. And I was walking down the street, and he was outside, and his song came on. And I, I made a comment about it. It's, but I didn't know it was him. And it was, because he, he had a very high voice, and I said, God, that guy sounds like a girl. And he started laughing. So the next day, he was on a TV show called Shebang. And what's the name of the singer again? 
Chris Montez. Okay, awesome. All his right, so he was on was Shebang. He, he was with A&M, and his first big hit was Let's Dance. And that hit propelled him to tour in England, and the Beatles were his opening act. And were you there for that? Oh, no. That was, the, that was 1963. Oh, okay. I was only like 11 when that happened. Yeah, we're a little too young. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so um, you've got the transistor radio walking by. I can totally yeah. picture it. And and I'm bobbing by because I, you know, Miss Miss Cool. He always yeah. still tells me because you were just so cool. And um, the next day he was on a TV show called Shebang with Casey Kasem, and I'm like, Mom, that guy lives across the street. And she goes, No, he doesn't. No. And I go, Mom, that guy does. So my mom had to go somewhere. And I, I walked across the street and stood on the corner and waited for him to come home. Really? And what did what yeah. happened when he came home? Well, it, he got out of the car, and I said, "Hey, I just saw you on Shebang." And he goes, "Oh, you did." And he's very humble, and he doesn't like people to, you know, make a big deal over him still. And um, and he, we started talking, and he goes, "Is you, is anybody home at your house?" And I said. No, my mom had to leave, and he goes, I'll, let me get this makeup off, and I'll, I'll be over. So he came over, and here I am, you know, so stupid, not even getting what he's doing. And um, <laughs> he didn't ask me my age. And we were in our den, and I had been to the teenage fair that week, uh-huh. and I had a sign that said, wink, and I'll do the rest. So he kept wink. he looked at it, and he kept winking at me. Oh my gosh, he was just full on. I I think it was kind of like the second he saw you and the second you saw him, you both were in that game. It was just there. He he just it was there. And um when he left, he said, "Can I kiss you?" And I'd never kissed a boy before. <gasps> let alone a man. And how was so, that? It was amazing. So he kissed me and he said, I want to make love to you. And I'm like, I didn't know what that meant. Oh, no. What did you do? Was, what did you say? Well, I, I, I said, oh. And then my mom came home and he left. So I went to the library. This was so wait, stupid. wait, wait. What did library. your mom say when she came home and yeah. saw him there? Oh, you know, my mom was a musician. She played piano bar for 65 years. Oh, nice. And she thought he looked very young and she thought he was 18. Oh, okay. So she was, she was fine. And because he was famous, she was really fine. And um, so I went to the library that evening and looked it up, what that meant. And I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> you know? So You're like, was, I haven't uh, even got below the neck yet, dude. <laughs> that was May 28th, 1966. And then on June 3rd, he came over and he goes, look, I have an apartment at the Hermosa Beach. Let's go, I'm going to go surfing. Come with me. So we went to the beach, and he surfed, and then we went, and it was like, <laughs> he started his thing, and I'm like, oh, my God. And the funny thing was, is when he saw that I was a virgin, he said, how old are you? I said, well, how old do you think I am? And he said, 18, and I said, no. And he said, 17, and I said, no. Oh, no. And he goes, 16, and I said, I'll be 15 in August. And he went, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'll never touch you again. And he took me home. Uh-huh. Well, guess how long that lasted? About two days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And let's, let's so I need to kind of stop and say uh-huh. this for a second. I need to stop and say this for a second to the people out there. Because you and I were very young, both when we first met our first musicians. But I think we were, you know, our times, we were in a different headspace. We kind of matured earlier. We were expected to be grown up. And I don't think either of us would condone anybody doing this at that age these days. Not at all. No, no. We were different. Yeah. You know, we got married at 17. We had kids before we were 20. We were from a different generation. Nowadays, there's no way. I have granddaughters. One's 19, one's 16. There's no way I would condone that. Yeah. I yeah. always like to throw that in there because people kind of like to give us crap for being younger girls and how stupider you and your brain wasn't developed. And it's like, 
No, we were kind of raised differently. Gen X, you know, our we generation, were. baby boomers, we were all let loose at six years old. If we had a bike, go out and play. Go visit the That's world. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it was different in those days. I mean, I, I had to take care of my younger sister, and my mom worked at night. We grew up really fast. Yeah. You know, our yeah. parents were divorced, and it, my mom had several husbands, and my dad had several wives, and... You know, he really thought I was older because he said you were so above uh, people of, of your age, you know, and, and yeah. it was. It was a, I was a different person, and I looked older. Same. I think same with the with my, me and my friends. But, okay, so that lasted two days. We're going to get back to that. I just always like to throw that in so people yeah. kind of understand where yeah, we're coming it's from. It's something I would recommend in these days. And t- it's, it's different now. Yeah. It's different. Yeah, it is. Okay, but let's get back yeah. to the two days. To what? It lasted two days. Okay, so then a few days later, he's back at it, you know. And uh, he just couldn't, he couldn't leave me alone. And you know what's really funny? Is I've known this man since 1966. And we had many years where we didn't even see each other for 20 some years. And we ran into each other again about five years ago at a uh, charity event. And ever since then, he, he just, he can't stay away from me. He but see, can't. I love that, though, because you guys, how long in the beginning, now, was he your first, first of everything? My first of everything. That's crazy. Everything. So you and I have that in common. We both were the first of first of everything was musicians. Mm-hmm. Yes. So it was just kind yeah, of something that, and, and, and with your and mom that. being a musician, I think it was just something you were naturally kind of born into, really. Well. I think so, and because my mother was a musician, I naturally, you know, always liked, well, I fell in love with Paul McCartney and John Lennon, you know. Oh, did you? I always vibed towards musicians, and I'm married to one now. Yes, you you are. It's it's like, it's my blood, and it was so funny because when I met Priscilla a couple weeks ago, and she she asked me my name, and I said, it's Melody, and I'm Melody, and she said, you look like a Melody, Uh and I'm like, what does that mean? You know, yeah, yeah. very sweet, but bold and beautiful and not boring for sure. That's how I see Melody. Okay, so back to his work. So he was your first of everything. Then what? Then what after that? Well, then he was taking me to A&M Records and I'd meet all these, you know, rock stars and singers. And I remember he was uh, doing a recording session and Joel Larson from the grassroots Uh was there. And... I was sitting there with my mini skirt, you know, here I am, 15 years old. And um, he grabbed my hand. He goes, come on, come with me. Let's go. And Chris saw that. And he stopped his recording session. And he said, that's it. And he grabbed me and he goes, I can't bring you back here. You know, <laughs> just, but, but it would just so happen that um, his best friend, Rocky, who was a executive with KTLA, mm-hmm. which is, you know, what, what, what the dance shows were he would take, if there was anybody I wanted to see that was appearing, Rocky would take me. So, um, it was so funny when Sonny and Cher. I was going to ask about that because you did send me a picture uh-huh. of you with Sonny. So let's talk about that well, one. Well, when Sonny and Cher were on, um, I resembled her in those days. You did. You did. Before she had Although her, I think you are surgery. as beautiful as I think Cher is. I thought you were more beautiful. Oh, that's what Chris used to say, but thank you. He he uh, he knew her anyway. So I I'm standing out in the driveway, and they pull out in their Excalibur, right? Uh huh. And they and Sonny stops the car, and he's signing autographs. And uh, I was the only one that had a pen, so I gave him my pen, and he signs. You know, I've got with love, share, and Sonny. I've got the autograph still. And he goes, "Whose pen is this?" And I said, "It's mine." And he looks up, and he goes. Oh, my God. What's your name? Give me your phone number. You look like Cher. And so I did. And that night, he actually called my mom. Oh, my gosh. He, that's crazy. He her, get this. He asked her if I could be Cher's stand-in. And were and you? That is so no. cool. Why did your mom say no? Because she said I was too young. Whoa. And she didn't want me going on the road. She only knew. Well, yeah, I can see that. 
We had to lie to our mom. I told her I was camping. I camped a lot in the 80s, even though I was on the road with bands. Uh, my mom was, you know, she was a musician. She was pretty wise. Yeah. So she she wouldn't let me do it. And I was so mad at her and so disappointed. But um, I did get to meet up with him. Well, her too. The funny thing about her is I do have a picture with her, but she wouldn't take one with me. She put all her hair in her face. Is that the one with the red pants that you sent me? Yep. I was wondering if that was her. So, okay, cool. Yeah, now that's her. clarified. I thought it was. Cause it was, and it and looks like you guys, you me. guys, I can then, see the resemblance back then. I can see that match. That is crazy cool. And uh, I knew Rodney Binghamheimer. Do you know who that is? Yes, we do, because we get a lot of people talking about Sable Star and Laurie Maddox. Well, One of my episodes, the most watched ones, is about, um, okay. and I do that documentary, Look Away L.A., about Rodney okay. Binghamheimer and Kim Fowler. So, yeah. Tell us more about Rodney Bingerham, Bingenheimer first hand. Rodney Bingenheimer, I met, he grabbed me at the teenage fair. And he said, God, he was friends with Cher and Sonny. And he said, God, you look so much like Cher. And I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. And even Cher's mom, who was there, Georgia, told me, she goes, you look just like my daughter. It was really funny. And um, I don't resemble her now because we've both changed so much. But anyway, uh, so Rodney wanted me to come over to his little tiny apartment on, um, God, what was the name of the street in Hollywood? And he, he gave me all these pictures of all these rock stars, the Bee Gees and everybody that he'd met, you know, and he called me a couple times, but he was like in his thirties then. Yeah. And, um, now did I you feel interested. creepy vibes around him? Because I always felt that he kind of exploited the younger girls for his advantage to get he those did. rock stars in his club. So you felt he that. Did. But I wised up real fast. Yeah. Real fast. And I was like, mm-mm. You didn't this. fall into the same trap that Sable and Lori did. Yeah. It was like, come on. And But he was nice. I mean, I can't, I can't say he wasn't nice. But he was just so, um, you know what he was? He was just so such a star fucker. <gasps> oh, my gosh. I said that about him, too. So, oh, my gosh. That's crazy. Yeah. So when I, when I was talking to Cher that day, um, we were at the airport, actually, and Sonny had asked me to come by because at those days you could just hang out with people at the airport in yeah. LAX. And um, so my girlfriend and I went, and she was sitting there, and, and I was sick to this. She did turn me on to uh, Pearl S. Buck. That was her favorite author. Oh, and she nice. was reading. I'll never forget this. She was reading Imperial Woman, and she said, you should read this. You would really like this this author. Anyway, and I said, you know, um, I said something like, I know Rodney Binghamheimer. You know how you just blurt stuff out yeah. when you're 16? And she goes, oh, Rodney. She goes, would you believe he tried to ball me? <laughs> oh, my God. I could totally hear Cher saying that, too. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. And I was like. Well, and how old was, was Cher? Boy, Cher, I'm guessing, was, wasn't was much older than you at the time. No, she's. um Six or seven years older than me. Oh, okay. Yeah. So she's early 20s. Yeah, she was in her 20s. Yeah. And, um, but she was, you know, let's put it this way. When I went to see her in Vegas, my I really wanted to see her, her perform because I, I, I love her voice. Yeah. And I was sitting, like, in the front. And after the show, her girlfriend that wrote that Take Me Home song with her. Uh-huh came up to me and she said, oh my God, you look so much like Cher. Would you like to meet her? And, <laughs> and you're I like, said, well. <laughs> I said, I already have. Thank you. I didn't like her. She wasn't, she was a bitch. Really? Yeah, she was. She I, was I could kind of see that in, in her, you know, as, mm -hmm. as nice as I think she is. I think she's pretty curt and pretty forward that way. Well, like, the fact that she did that for our picture, I was like, who does that? Yeah. You know? But she was so, um, maybe she was insecure about Sunny. I don't know. You know, I think because too. didn't she get with Sunny when she was so young? Yeah, she did. That. So uh, maybe it was she kind did. of that Priscilla syndrome, that kind of insecure, was, that kind you know, of feeling... It was feeling... so long. Not a, any other star that I've met, and I know movie stars as well, 
they would never do that to a fan. Never. No. So I was like so off her, but she did have a great show. But did she look at you maybe as Sunny trying to replace her, you know, or trying to... Well, there's no way. I mean, you know, I'm 16 years old. I mean, and she's like this major icon, but I just think she didn't like people looking like her. That's what I think. She wanted to be different. And my mother had bought me all of, you know, she had her clothes line out in those days. Oh, that's and right. I had all her clothes. Yeah. I dressed like her. Yeah. She was my idol until that day. And I think a lot of women kind of had that beautiful, you know, thick bang, nice black eyeliner. That look it was very much a 60s, 70, early 70s thing. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't yeah, just it was Cher. Just it was Cher <laughs> being part of that trend, which was a lovely looking trend. And I think looked up beautiful on a lot of women. Because you look at the women in the UK, same kind of look, that same time. It was very vogue. Yes. Yes, you're right. Yeah, so she, I think so she was just was, kind of up her own ego a little bit then. Yeah. But, I, you know, I always ran into people. Like, I was at the Tiffany Theater in Hollywood with a bunch of friends of mine to see the movie The Producers. This is how long ago this was. Mm -hmm. Probably 1969. And some guy was sitting behind us, and he was coughing and snorting. And, eh, 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 eh. and I okay. turned around, and I said, shut up. Now, I was a skinny little thing in those days, but I had a big mouth, and um, it was Jim Morrison. <gasps> really? That's so crazy. He, yeah, I think he was stoned out on reds or something. So he stands up, and this guy was tall, and he stands up, and he was wearing his stinky leathers that he never washed. Oh, I hate that. Oh. And he put his hands on his hips, and he bent down, and he said, what did you say, little girl? And I pointed, put my finger in his face, and I said, why don't you take your crystal ship and cram it up your ass? Oh. And my friends were like, oh, my God. And he turned around, and he walked out. Oh, and my God. my friends God. were like, you just told off Jim Morrison. What did I you said, well, he should have shut up. Yeah, but I love that attitude, you know? It's like, I don't care if it's Jim Morrison, he's got to shut the fuck up. Somebody's well, got to make him load right, the dishwasher. I was already with a rock star for several years by then, and these people didn't impress me anymore. Right? You know? No, and I agree, because a lot of people are like, I don't know what, what, what I would say to these guys if I was near them. It's like, they're just human beings. They're just human beings. They're just... When I met... Uh, the birds, remember the birds? Yes. And Dave Crosby and Jim McGuinn, what now Roger McGuinn. Yeah. Um, Roger, Jim, he was Jim then, and he was really nice. Uh, and he took a picture with me, and I think I sent it to you. Yeah. And Dave Crosby was such a dick, I couldn't believe it. I've heard the same thing. So, okay, what happened with Crosby? He was just, um, he was, he was standing in the corner. And my girlfriend and I walked up to him, and he just brushed us off like he wanted nothing to do with us. And uh, he just had a really, you could feel his energy was so negative. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in those days, I wasn't too involved with drugs, and he probably was stoned, you know, and I didn't know it. But um, I, didn't, I didn't feel good about him. He, he was standoffish, and he had a scowl on his face. I like that you said that, that you right didn't now. feel good stoned. about him, because, you know, too many girls these days go out and try and force things into the way they see with that certain rock star. As to where back in our day, we were like, how's that chemistry? It's just, um, I don't know. You know, it's so, like I said, and you said, it's so different now. And in those days, everybody was approachable. And we connected. Exactly. I like and, the way you put that. Yeah. And there was a connection because not only of the music, but of the mind. I was already into metaphysics. I've been studying since I was 12. Uh -huh. And I was very um, into the spiritual thing. And, and they were too. You know, it, it was just I was younger than them, but ahead of them because I began my studies so young. Yeah. So it was, it was always a connection. And even my mother, 
would say to me, because I, I remember um, going to see The Unsinkable Molly Brown, and I loved Hart Presnell, who was the lead. Mm-hmm. And he came out and he walked right up to me and he goes, hey, how are you? And my mom goes, he, they, these people think they know you. And Shirley McLean did it too. She walked up to me and she goes, continue your studies, whatever you do. I mean, it, they've always, it's weird. They're, they, they're drawn to me for some reason. Yeah, just and, like a natural, This because yeah, you yeah, can feel somebody who's like home in the middle of a crowd. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, my best friend was Cindy Williams. I uh, Yeah, we were, I was going to ask you about that. Now, how did you and Cindy meet? And for those of you who don't well, know, Cindy Williams for Gen X, Laverne and Shirley. Well, Iconic show that she was just an amazing actress. In fact, I call my cat Boo Boo Kitty. <laughs> she was the sweetest person. In fact, her daughter, who I'm her daughter's second mom, just mm-hmm. had a baby boy on Tuesday. Well, congratulations! And, and and Emily, who's her daughter, said you're you're going to be you're going to be the best glam ma ever. You are and going to be. Thank you. I already have ten grandkids, but Cindy actually named the baby before she died, and Emily wasn't pregnant yet. Really? Yes. How did she know? She was uh, very intuitive. That's oh, pretty we talked cool. about it, and I told her, you know, we both agreed that Emily one day would have a baby boy. And yeah. Cindy said, this is what I want him to be named. Oh, that's so amazing that she, oh. Yeah, so, we named him. And, and how long were you and Cindy friends? Is. When did you guys meet? Okay, in in the early 90s, well, it was the early 90s or late 80s, I, you know, I'm, I'm a clairvoyant medium, and I, I was doing readings, and I still do, and I met this gal, Kelly, at a lecture on um, instrumental transcommunication, which is talking to the dead through radio waves and light waves, and Kelly's husband was Cindy's manager, I mean, assistant, oh, wow. assistant. so Kelly kept saying, you need to meet Cindy, Cindy needs to meet you. And one day, she, I guess she told Cindy about me, and Cindy said, bring her over. And um, so we went to, to the house in, in Malibu, and Cindy and I met. And she kept coming to me for readings, and all of a sudden, it morphed into this other thing, this, this friendship. We really, really got along well, and... I helped her a lot. She was going through a lot with Bill Hudson. And um, we just clicked and became friends. And before you knew it, we were more than friends. We were family. She still has a bedroom in my house. She always stayed with me. She always stayed with us. And I'm so uh, sorry that you lost her, you know. I mean, oh. as Gen X, we lost someone that we felt very close to. But you really, truly lost your sister and soulmate. I really did, and I, I, I miss her so much, but now I'm excited because another part of her is on the earth now. Oh, that's so, so really great. So, yeah. And of course, through Cindy, I met many, many, many movie stars and celebrities and became friends with them. So, you know, it's just... Who's your favorite actor know. that you've ever met outside of Cindy? My favorite one that I've ever met outside of Cindy. That's a really good question. Um... Well, it has to be Elvis. Well, let's talk about Elvis. How'd you guys meet? I was 22, and my I'd never been to Vegas, and my aunt, who's also a musician who was, she played a violin in his orchestra. So I called her, and I said, I want to go to his concert. She said, well, I can't take you backstage because they don't allow that, but I will... Get you tickets and you come and stay with me. And my cousin Sharon, who was about 30, she was, and you and Sharon could go to the concert. And I said, okay, so we did. And uh, my, my cousin Sharon was very paranoid, you know, because she worked at the Waitress in Vegas and she thought everybody, she thought all the major deeds tried to prostitute women. Yeah, back okay. then they did. Mm hmm. So after the first show, Charlie Hodge walks over to our table, and he said, 
I want to invite you to the second show. And she said, no, we're not doing that. And I said, oh, yes, we are. Oh, she knew what the second show was all about. <laughs> yes. So we stayed for the second show. And um, she says, I'm leaving. And I said, okay, we'll leave. And then Charlie came back up and he goes, I want to invite you ladies to uh, this tweet. And she said, no. And I said, oh, yeah, I'm going. Yeah, you don't turn down an Elvis invite. You don't turn down. So we, I got her to go on the elevator to the penthouse. And when the elevator door opened, you know, the security was there with names and all that. And she goes, I'm leaving. I'm not doing this. And I said, bye. <laughs> I love it. So she left. And I, I knew I was going to get in trouble for this, but I didn't care. So then, you know, they um, walked us to Elvis's suite. He was in the bedroom. And I was talking to John Wilkinson, who was his guitar player, his big guitar player. And Johnny was really nice. In fact, him and my mom ended up becoming friends. And um, so Elvis finally came. You couldn't believe the electricity. And you know what was funny? I was a Beatles fan. I was not an Elvis fan. Really? Until... But that until, he did have that just kind of aura, and you guys just had that chemistry that was just off the hook? He was... He came, when he came out on stage, electricity went through me. Ooh. I felt him so heavy. It was unbelievable. So he comes out, and there's, there had to be about 12 women that were all older than me, you know, but I was the only one with black hair. Interesting. And he loved black hair. Yes, he did. So he comes out and he looks around and he greets everybody and he looks at me and he cooked his finger like, come here. And? Of course I went with him into his room. Of course I did. Nice. And he was kind and loving and sweet he loved talking about spiritual things which i was already into yeah because he did he a lot of people don't realize that you know his california house would, was like the japanese garden with the buddhas and mm -hmm. uh, that whole spiritual side to him that i love probably my favorite eldest years oh this was the most beautiful man i would ever seen you know he had his head was shaped different than most people it was kind of like elongated in the back uh-huh. You know, um, he had, he showed me the roof of his mouth went way, way up high. Like, um, how can I describe it? It just, it, it was not flat. It was, it was like a tunnel. Oh, wow. You know? Yeah. And he, he was um, gentle and sweet and not circumcised, which I had never seen before. Okay, so quick question, because a lot of other women that were with Elvis had said he didn't know how to, you know, do the do, do the South thing. That he had told them that he didn't know how to do the South thing, and would they teach him? That seems like kind of like a line he used to use on women. Did he use that on you? No, he didn't. Oh, okay. He was more... Um, he didn't. He was more um, gentle. Yeah. You know, and he was, uh, this guy was not into intercourse, I'll tell you that much. He was all about the oral thing. Oh, wow. And mm -hmm. that's crazy. I wonder yeah. why, do you think it was maybe because of all the pills he took that, you know, that affected certain things? Uh, it Possibly, yes. And okay. Because he he had such a um, spiritual. He didn't just want to fuck. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That wasn't who he was. He was more into getting to know who you were and talking about spirituality and about you know his family and cuddling very cuddly and close. Um, loved to kiss. Nice. Softest lips in the whole world. Just a beautiful man. Yeah. And he wasn't um, aggressive. That's it. He wasn't aggressive. 
That's really cool. I like that though. And I like that you guys connected, you know, on that intellectual and spiritual level that you had those conversations, you know, well, because, cool I, because I, I say that those with many people. No, he doesn't because that's when you connect with the rock star on the road, that's what it's all about right there. And that's not an everyday thing. Mm -mm. And he gave me several things that night. And he actually gave me one of the TLC necklaces, Tender Loving Care, which my ex-husband stole from me. Oh, I would have chased that guy down with yeah. my car. Well, I tried, but that's another <laughs> story. But I do still have some of the mementos he gave me. And, um, you know, I went to Graceland a couple years ago, and I cried through the... I couldn't stop crying. Oh. I, I cried through the whole thing. And I actually saw him in the racket room, his spirits in the ra racquetball room. Oh, really? And when I told, yeah, and when I told the gal uh, that, that was, you know, the host of there... But he, he, I feel him. He's here, and she goes. He, every a lot of people say that. Right in that specific area. Say, That's cool. And the last thing he did before he died was play racquetball. Oh, that I did not know that. Yeah, and wow. you know he didn't talk about Priscilla. He didn't talk about her. Um, yeah, I couldn't imagine. You know, because they kind of tend to separate the road from home. You got your yeah. road family, and you got your home family. Well, I think they had broken up that year. Oh, really? So he was new. He was new, but he was still fooling around, you know. Yeah, of course. Um, but he was new. But it was so funny because I couldn't believe all these beautiful women in this suite, and he picked me. I couldn't believe it. Well, look at yourself. You're a stunner. Of course he picked you. <sighs> and you were that. I think you were, you're that per perfect combination of that beautiful and that sweet that he was really actually drawn to. He did like he did like that innocence, even though I wasn't. But he did like that, mm -hmm. you know. And he yeah. liked youth. He liked young. He did like young. Yeah, and you so were twenty two at this point, in their 30s so and I was twenty two. Yeah. So you know, but it was um, it was a night I'll never forget. I. I haven't told a lot of people about it because you know how people are. Oh, yes, I do. Trust me. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I don't talk about it a lot, but, you know, I trust you, of course. And Yeah. Um, it was something that I just needed to get out. And how weird that two weeks ago I met Priscilla. That was just so weird. But, of course, I didn't tell her I even ever met Elvis because... Well, technically, they were separated and on their way to divorce, so you have nothing to worry about. But, yeah, why tell the ex-wife, no, you, you know, know? The sadness, there's so much sadness in her eyes. Yeah. So much. And I just wanted it to be a good thing. And, not, you know, I wanted it to be about her. Yeah. And it was. And she's... A, I could see why he fell in love with her. I can, too. I think she's got a great heart and spirit, and I think she really was more prepared for that world than she thought she was. And I think I she know, became an Allison, even stronger woman because of it. She told me she's overwhelmed with all the attention she gets. She said, people want to meet me. It overwhelms me. Yeah. So I don't know. But I do know that, wow, you know, so many years later, I meet her, his wife, after being with him. That one night with you, yeah. The song one night with you, and boy, was it was it a night. Oh, that is good to hear. That is really good to hear because I was always afraid I was going to hear like he was a jerk or a dud or stuff like that. So no. I'm so glad to hear that it was everything that you know people. It, it was everything a girl would dream of with Elvis Presley. That's amazing. He was beautiful, and he. What I liked about him was, you know, Chris Montez is very humble. And so was he. He didn't make a big deal about himself. Yeah. I he think he kind of had people... to be because even the people around him, you know, the Memphis yeah. Mafia, that they kind of had big egos and big personalities and big mm -hmm. go home, go big or go home all the way. So I think Elvis was kind of the calm in the center of the storm as far as his attitude went. He, he was, um, he just, he, he wanted to just be himself. Like he told me when he went back to Graceland, 
he wasn't Elvis Presley. Mm -hmm. He was Elvis, and he was home, and he just wanted to be a normal person. Yeah. You know, he did get a kick out of, out of all the women who fawned over him and screamed over him. He loved it. He got a kick out of that. Oh, but I bet, though. Um, he wasn't egotistical at all. Not at all. That's really good to hear, though. Day, I love that. Huh? I love that. That's really good to hear. You know what's really funny is Sunny West drove me home the next day to my aunt's house, uh -huh. and I get in trouble. But I bet you did what she do. <laughs> she she read me the riot act, and, and you were like, "Okay, it's worth know, that riot act because said, it was I'm Elvis Presley, baby." <laughs> I'm I'm I mean I I'm rehearsing with him all the time and he takes all these drugs and he does this and he does that. How could you do me? And then she goes, Well, don't tell your mom. That's what she said. Don't tell I your mom. mom anyway. Um Well what's funny, Sunny West drove me back to my aunt's house and it was really nice and would you believe I don't know. Twelve years later, my best, my son became best friends with Sonny's son. Oh my gosh! You know what? It was just really there's that connection that keeps you there with that, you know, that whole thing. Yeah, there's always there's always that connection, and you and I tap into the higher level of energy that musicians are on. Yes, we do. We see something different because. You know, it's like you have Elvis and somehow you're always connected with them. Somehow I'm, I'm always I'm always connected with John, obviously, okay. and somehow with Metallica. So I think that you using, you, you telling me that is a really great example of that. The, it's a small it, world in rock and roll, you know. Because and, and it's not only that, it's actors. They're very, I do a lot of celebrity events and uh -huh. I've gotten to know a lot of celebrities. But they, they come early to the event to see me. They wait for me. That's and amazing. So I love weird that. To me. And, uh, years ago, I, I was dating another musician, an English guy. And I said to him, John, you know, these people, and I, I was naming the people, they're waiting six and seven hours to talk to me. And he goes, you don't get it, do you? And I said, no, I don't. And he said, you do something different than them. They all do the same thing, but you do something different. That's so very true. And you can give them a kind of calmness and, you know, insight. And when people are in chaos and you give them those readings, for me, it's like, like I said, it's an insight, it's a calmness. It's like, huh, you know, so yeah, of course, who would not wait six, seven hours for you? Plus, you're such a sweetheart. Oh, thank you. So, of well, course. Well, you know, I'm happy to say I've worked with a lot of troubled kids and have saved lives. Nice. I, it's amazing. One of the prominent doctors uh, who wears it. His daughter was anorexic, and she was 13, 5 foot 6, weighed 60 pounds. And they had her in and out of the hospital three times, and they heard about me, and in six months, she was well. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, and Melody. When, when Jack and I were first dating, uh, they were having a big party with all the doctors, and they invited me, and he introduced me as the woman who saved his daughter's life. So, and now she's traveling the world saving anorexic girls. That's such a way, great way to give back. I love that. Yeah. So, so it's just, um, my work is really important to me, and I love <laughs> what I do, but <clears throat> the other side is... I had a hell of a lot of fun. Yeah, you did. So who is the actor that you've had the most fun with? Martin Landau. Tell us about that. How'd you meet him? My, okay, I met Martin. Um, I was doing a celebrity event, and this girl, Gretchen, who was dating Martin, was there, and I did her reading, and she said, oh, you've got to meet Martin. So a couple of days later, you know, she invited me over and Martin was there. And, oh, God, what an amazing man. And we just really hit it off. And I would babysit his cat. And he oh. would call me from, he would call me from wherever he was filming, 
you know, and he, he was, he, the stories he told were amazing. He became like a dad to me, and I loved him. Um, he was a lot of fun because he had these great stories. This guy was, he was a, a painter, and he told me I could have made millions of dollars forging paintings. There's a lot of money in forgeries. Oh, yeah, there's. Yeah. You know, I'm an art history major, so I know all about that. And the art world is a very intriguing world as far as that's concerned. Right. And, of course, Cindy, she, we always had fun. Yeah. Always. Um, Penny wasn't as, as uh, nice as Cindy. Penny Marshall. In fact, Penny treated Cindy pretty badly. You know, I've heard that before, and that kind of makes okay. me sad because... Did Penny always think that because she was Laverne, she was the most dominant and that's the one everybody loved? But for me, I think it was the combination that they were both equal. They had, and Cindy will admit it, they had magic. Yeah. They were magical. I'm looking at all the pictures in my in my reading, in my office, I'm trying to think, who did I have the most fun with? Besides, oh, Ruth Buzzy, I love Ruth she um, seems like she'd be fun. I like her. She, yeah, she, she's always on. She's always on. And I'm looking at Danny Trejo has been a close, close friend and client for 40 years. Love that picture of you too. Danny's a sweetheart, but God dang, does he have a temper? Well, yeah, you know, some people. Boy down so many times. You, oh, you did? Oh, Jesus. He would call me in three in the morning. At three in the morning, and he'd be yelling and screaming because he and his, his wife at the time would, would always fight. And, you know, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, but we stayed we stayed close. I'm looking at all these pictures. And I'm trying to think who I really really enjoyed being with besides Martin. Well, all of them really. But um, oh, Jolie Fisher, I love Jolie. Really? Oh yeah, Connie Stevens' daughter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's uh, she's great. Oh, that's She's lovely great. to hear. Yeah, and um, oh, Gio Marini, I love Gio. He's a sweetheart. You know who that is, right? Yeah. He is gorgeous and a sweetheart. John O'Hurley, uh, I was doing a party for the Maloofs in Vegas. I think it was... I know the Maloofs. I used to party with them in uh, Vegas. You know <laughs> yeah, and John O'Hurley came up to me at the party and he goes, who's going to kiss you at midnight? And I said, nobody, I'm working. And he goes, well, I'm going to kiss you at midnight. And he did. And um, how was that midnight kiss? Was it worth it? Oh, it was so sweet. It was oh, so nice. sweet. Yeah, he, he was a doll. Taylor Negron. Do you know who Taylor Negron is? No, I'm not sure I do. Well, his cousin, who's a, also a close friend of mine, is Chuck Negron from Three Dog Night. Okay, yeah. Okay, Taylor was a character actor, and if you look up his face, you'll know exactly who he is. And he, I was going through a divorce, and he was my best friend during that time. Just a wonderful, wonderful guy. And we hung out every Sunday, and we'd go to the Luna Cafe and watch the comedians. He was a comedian. And um, a lot of people know who he is. Yeah. And he was wonderful. And wouldn't you know, <clears throat> I ended up meeting Chuck Negron, but I never knew, Taylor never told me that Chuck was his cousin. <laughs> so when Chuck, <laughs> when, when I met Chuck and he said he was at my house and he saw my my pictures of Taylor, he goes, you know my cousin? I said, so you Wait, didn't meet Negron, them through Taylor. each other, you just sort of met them organically at different times. Yeah. Oh, crazy. Yeah, and then, and then I lost Tay. Tay died uh, a few years ago. and But Chuck and I have stayed really close friends. Really close friends. His wife and I are very, very close. And, um, boy, what a story that man has. Whew. Why? That night? Yeah, what about that? Oh, my God. You know, um, what a life he led. This guy went to $45 million on drugs. That sounds right for about the 60s or 70s and into the mm -hmm. 80s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but he's uh, he's a lovely guy. I yeah. love Chuck so much. Um, but he went through a lot with Three Dog Night. I mean, Danny Hutton, 
It was just horrible to him. Just horrible. Really? Oh, that's another story. Just because they make know, great just, music th- together doesn't make mean they're great friends. And we no, always say that. No. Like I always say, none of the guys from The Who hung out off stage. The guys in Metallica yeah. don't. You know, there's little clicks on the road. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's so... Um, it, it always surprises me because, you know, when Chuck was doing the... Uh, what tour was that? Oh, the Happy Together tour. Uh So he'd always invite us, you know, and we'd go backstage and meet everybody. And I I couldn't believe, because I'm so used to meeting uh, rock stars that are really friendly, I couldn't believe how many of them are such snotty little jerks. Who was the snottiest jerk you met among the musicians? Mark Lindsay. Mark Lindsay. Which band is he from? Uh, he was Paul Revere and the Raiders. Okay, okay. Why? What did he do? What happened with he that? He's just a snob. He's just very unfriendly and cold and doesn't want to bother with anybody. You know, after Chuck does a concert, he's out there in the crowd. He's signing autographs. Yeah. and uh, Not Mark. Mm-mm. No, he's just... Not at all. There's always that one kind of ego in the band, you know? Yeah, yeah. It just surprises me because I've met, as as of you, so many people that are such big stars. Yeah. And, you know, the little punk ones, they're like, oh, my God, you got to be kidding me. Who do they think they are? <laughs> you know, one hit wonders. I mean, you know, come on. No, I know. And so. it's like because they have to be, they're only relevant for that one thing. You know, as to where the bigger stars, there's a lot of things that are more relevant, like Cher, you know. She may be a bitch, but at least she's relevant in 12 different directions. Yeah, and you know, Chris, he he was a big star back in the day. Uh-huh. And he's still touring. Now, and how long were you and, did you and Chris end up seeing each other? Oh, what, I'm sorry, what? How long did you and Chris end up seeing each other? Oh, I was with him 10 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um... And then he, he always told me, as soon as you turn 18, I'm going to marry you. And? And I believed him. And he, he didn't. He married somebody else. Oh, my gosh. I'm so sorry. Is Which, that? He broke my heart. Is he that how it ended? He just sort of married somebody else? Yeah. And it, it turned into a real terrible thing for him, <clears throat> which I told him. Anyway, he didn't tell me he was getting married. And, and it's a long story. His that friend had died, and he called me up, and he was crying, and he said, just remember whatever happens after today, I'll always love you. And the next day, he married her. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah, and so um, guess what? Four months later, guess who he called? Me. Yeah, because how was it working out for the marriage? It what didn't. So See? he came back. Came back. They got and, a divorce. He came back to me. Yeah. And then, then what after that? Well, after that, he was fooling around a lot. Yeah, as they do. Because he was, you know, he was a big star in uh, South America, and traveling, and he was fooling around a lot. And then he, he said, "Look, this isn't fair to you. I, I can't do this to you. I'm, I'm going to ruin your life." Yeah. And then he was gone. Probably, you know what, it's probably the best thing he could have ever done for you. You know, I always sense. say rock stars, they are the best men. They're great friends. They make wonderful lovers that I'm not just talking about in the sheets, you know, because lovers something bigger than that. But they don't make great husbands, you know, and that's no. just was never an appeal to me to be on that side of it. No, me too. Yeah, it's true. And he, he kept telling me that even to this day, he tells me that. Now, he's married to this wonderful gal named Chaz Kelly, who was a DJ on KRS 101. Uh-huh. And she and I are friends, you know, and I really, really like her. And she's good for him. He's 81 years old, you know. And, and we Chad are not this old. He, huh? Nobody's that old. Not our generations. <laughs> I know. Yeah, but he's still touring. That's so cool. And he, he was just at Clearwater. Uh, on a tour, and what's funny is he gets back home, 
And when he gets in his car, he calls me before he calls his wife. Oh, I kind of love that. You know, because you guys are go so, so, so far back, and he needs kind of that calming and that. You know, nobody knows me like you do. Nobody understands me like you do. Nobody knows my family because they're all died. He was one of 18 kids. Wow. They're all gone. And he said, and he goes, he goes, I'm just, you and I are so connected and we have this great friendship and my husband understands it and his wife understands it. So it's good. And see, I love that. And I think we're going to, cause we're about in an hour here and we've got some good stuff and Melody, I want you to come back because there's more. I'd love to peel your ear, but, but I love that you say that, that, you know, there's, there's that connection. Cause a lot of people think that, you know, the women that they know on the road or behind the scenes, whatever, Mm -hmm. are just kind of disposable and I love it that you still have those friendships that you've created those bonds and the souls have really stuck together so I love that isn't it wonderful it is you know Allison you and I are blessed we lived a life that nobody nobody has lived that's true we kind of went a little bit bigger we were kind of the go go big or go home types weren't we yeah, <laughs> I think we still are. <laughs> we definitely still are. <laughs> <laughs> Great speaking with you. Oh, and thank you so much, finally. Melody. I'm so finally glad to get you on the show and just really excited to hopefully talk again. And I love your book. And I love you. Thank you so much for finding me that way. I'm just, that's the one. You're still my favorite. Oh, you're still my favorite, though. I love it. And thank you just so much for sharing everything today. Well, people keep telling me to write a book. and I'm You like, need oh. to. You need to leave this legacy behind. I mean, I think, you know, with all those stale Hollywood stories coming out, just like the stale groupie stories, that's one thing you have. Yours is a different aspect, a different take, just like my book was, you know. So I mm-hmm. think you should 100%. Tell her down in the comments, people, write the book. Write the book. Right. But right. Thank you. You thank are you welcome. And no, thank you for just coming on and being such a wonderful person. And I will talk to you soon, hon. Okay. Bye. Right. Bye bye. Love you. Bye-bye. Love you.